we are talking about security controls and mechanisms. And this is a very high level look at a very wide range of tools and techniques in security to solve a whole lot of different types of problems. So what I'm aiming to do in this, um, this lecture is basically give you an overview of all the sorts of things you can do to protect, uh, of some of the most important ways you can protect your computer against various kinds of attack. So very broad, wide ranging um, discussion of a lot of important things. So there was a slide last week, but obviously it was towards the end of the lecture and there was um, you know, a lot of other stuff that we were trying to cover, but some of the goals when we are managing the security of a system is to basically prevent attacks from happening. So if we can prevent an attack from happening, then we can, you know, obviously that's best case scenario. So we, we put stuff, defenses in place so that someone tries to attack a system and they fail. So we put some kind of security control in place um, and then, you know, we're happy because uh, we managed to defend against some kind of attack. But you have to assume that's not always going to work because generally speaking, um, there's, you, you can't assume uh, that you're going to successfully defend against um, an attack if, if the banks can't protect themselves. Uh, and, you know, every major company that I can think of off the top of my head has had some kind of security incident in the last decade then what are the chances that your company that you're working for is going to have like a perfect security track record? At some point something's going to go wrong and when that happens you want to be able to detect that something's happened. So we want to be able to determine that an attack's either occurred or it's currently happening uh, and that's usually done by just monitoring the things that are happening on the system and checking is this what we're expecting this system to be doing at the moment? Does this make sense? If it doesn't then that's worth you know, investigating, doing something about and once we've discovered that something's gone wrong, we need to be able to recover our systems. So we want to be able to stop the attack. So, okay, we've noticed that we're currently under attack. What can we do to prevent it from getting worse? And um, you know, how do we actually restore things from backups and make sure that we're back to a secure state and um, you know, happy, basically. So, one of the, the, so there's a, some things that we can put in place in order to um, maintain our, our security. And it's important to have policy. So the word pol policy for security policy kind of has two meanings. So there's the abstract idea of a policy. So for example, or like an administrative policy. So within a company, we've got a policy that says that people aren't allowed to use Facebook or you know, whatever. Um, and that's something that we might not have a technical something in place to stop them from doing that, but that's a rule within our organisation. Or we might have a, you're not allowed to sell all of our secrets to, um, uh, you know, someone working in another company, for example. That, that, that would be like a policy and there might be um, things in the policies uh, where you're working that would punish you if you broke those rules. And that, that's kind of very not the best example, but you know, those sorts of things. So rules about what you're allowed to use the work resources to do, what websites you're allowed to visit, uh, and those sorts of things. So then, or it might be technical rules for a, that a computer will actually enforce. So like firewall rules, for example. So we say this program is allowed access to this file, or this person is allowed access to this file, or this internet traffic is allowed and this one's not allowed. So we've got actual technical rules that specify what is and isn't okay within the, within the um, network or organization. But policy should always be designed to actually do something meaningful. So it should be mitigating some kind of threat and not just because we decided something was a good idea, but because we, you know, we've got certain things that our organization is aiming for and therefore we create a policy that makes sense. Um, and we would have, um, processes and procedures to actually um, implement that and manage it. So you, you would have um, a procedure where if someone did the wrong thing, there's actually a step, some steps that you would be carried out in order to do something about it, basically. 
Uh, because if you've got a policy, which is just a document stored on a network drive somewhere, and no one even knows what it is, and no one does anything about it, then you know, you've just wasted your time by writing a policy that no one's using. Um, so, you know, obviously, it involves work. And a control is a thing that actually enforces your policy, uh, or a security mechanism is, is an actual piece of software or a hammer or something that you use to enforce your rules. Um, so, you know, you have a whip or something. If you break those rules, you get th three lashes or whatever. That's your control. That's the thing that you're putting in place that actually enforces your rules. Uh, so it might be a method, a technical tool, or a procedure, um, but it's actually going to actively mitigate a threat. So, um, you know, it, it, and we obviously we're interested in computers and technical things, but the same thing could be said of like ancient Rome, where you would literally you have all these like torture tools, and those are your controls because people know if you do this thing, then this is the punishment, uh, and it tries to make sure that people are behaving uh, according to the policy that's in place. So some examples of controls are, you know, anti-malware software, firewalls, authentication, so, you know, having passwords to get onto your system, access controls like setting file permissions to say who's allowed to do what on a system, uh, sandboxes and virtualization, encryption, physical controls like having a lock on a door. All of these things are examples of controls. So, defense in depth is, it's a military strategy, but it, it also applies to security in a very, very important way. It's that we have multiple lines of defense. So if someone manages to jump the first fence in a prison, they still have to get past the second fence. If someone um, manages to get past your firewall rules, there should also be access control rules in place to control what they are able to do on that system. So basically, by having multiple layers of security, it means that if one doesn't, if, if one fails, we've got other things in place that will also, um, you know, provide protection. So if you if your laptop stolen, you basically you failed in your attempt to keep your physical thing secure. Um, if you've also encrypted all your files, then you, you have succeeded in one of your goals, which is so that other people can't access your files. So if you use full disk encryption on a laptop, if you're not already doing that, you should all do that now, um, then that means that if they get physical access to your laptop, they don't automatically get access to all your files. If you're not using encryption, even if there's a password dialogue that comes up when your computer turns on, you can just pull the hard drive out to get access to all your files. So um, the, that's, it's about having layers of defense and think of any other examples of defense in depth where you might have multiple layers of things to make sure that you're secure. Two-step verification. Yes, yeah, so um, yeah, multi-factor authentication, two-step um, authentication. So when you log into Facebook, if you've set up like Authenticator or whatever, they will, you know, you can look on your phone and get your code to log in to prove that you have your phone and yeah, it's a good example. Yeah. Well, there's 200 milliseconds of HTTPS, so TLS. Right. So that, that is, that is yes. several lines of defense. You've got authentication, and you've got encryption in that as well, haven't you? Yes. So, when you, so with HTTPS, it's um, right. It's, it's like an encrypted connection that uses public key cryptography. Um, the, I'm not sure what you mean by the layers of security. There's the encryption and the, the authentication of the server. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. In so like when they exchange the cipher suite and then the, the you've got yeah. that, that list of what it uses. So it might yeah. be RSA, yeah. TLS, RSA. Yeah. The, they security. negotiate what encryption algorithm to use yeah. when it connects. Um, and that is a layer of security. And I guess your other layer of security is like the domain name that you've typed in. So you, in order to break that, they need, um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. Any other examples? Yeah. Uh, like physically locking the door to the server. Yes. Yes. So um, yeah. So having a, a locked door in a server room, um, is, yeah, is. But what? So where's your other layer of security then? Encrypting the, the drives on the server. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Biometrics. Biometrics. 
So again, multi-factor authentication where you've got your fingerprint and your password or something like that, where you need to have both in order to log in. Yes, yeah, so there's lots of examples, and it's a really important um, concept in security. So what I want to do now, what I am going to do now, is talk about some specific threats or problems that we face when we're talking about security. And then I'll see, uh, basically give you guys the opportunity to try and um, tell me how you would actually defend against these kinds of things. Uh, so malware. So software that's intentionally malicious. So someone writes a virus, a worm, or a Trojan horse. Um, so software that the author who writes it wants is, once you run it on your computer, it's going to do something that you don't want your computer to do, basically, or a program on your computer to do. What can we do to defend against that? Educate. <coughs> Education? In what um, sense? Just to teach people how to, to spot you know, if that download link looks a bit, you know, mm -hmm. if the website looks a bit dodgy. Yes. Um, teach, you know, teach about Nigerian spam mail. <laughs> yeah, so it's true. It's true. There is like a social engineering aspect to it, or a if you don't know what you're doing, you're more likely to get malware. So making sure that people are doing stuff that makes sense on the computer. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So read and write permissions on the drives. Yes. So like Windows Seven, you can decide what drives your user can read or write on. So you can set them all to read only. Yes. So that would make it. Yep. So you're using access control, so file permissions to control the kinds of damage that malware could do. Linux. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I like your answer. Uh, yes, that's one way, but having said that, there's malware that targets the Linux. Have antivirus scan so if anything does go, I can pick up on it. Antivirus, so anti malware. Yes, so, um, so one of the main defenses against malware is to use software that detects known instances of that malware. So the, generally speaking, there's a few kinds of ways that anti-malware software works. So the signature based where it detects specific known instances of malware. So it's only, it basically, it's got a signature, some way of detecting, ah, oh, this is Stuxnet, or this is, you know, Netbus or whatever. It knows specific kinds of malware that it's looking for. And there's anomaly based um, detection where it looks at the behavior of the things that are happening on the system and it's like, well, it just accessed this file and then that file and then the internet, that looks really sus. So you know that we could flag that up as being um, a problem, so also known as heuristics. So it detects <coughs> suspicious behavior. Um, the problem is neither the, they're not very good at working basically. So it will detect a whole bunch of stuff that exists. So it's, not a, it's, it's a generally a good idea to have anti-malware but it, it fails miserably at detecting new stuff. So if I was to go to my office and write a new piece of malware and send it to you in an email, uh, yeah, pretty much guarantee that it's not gonna get detected by any anti-malware software. So de depending on how you write the, the new sample. And there's all sorts of things that you can do to avoid being detected by anti-malware as well, like using um, encoding and different um, obfuscation techniques and things. So yeah, so anti-malware. So another type of threat is software vulnerabilities. So a software vulnerability is a security weakness in a program. So basically, the author is trying to do the right thing. So for example, if I work at Microsoft, I never would, then, um, uh, then if I made a mistake while I was working on some code, it might end up being that a certain version of Windows or Office or whatever has a programming mistake in it that someone can take advantage of to try and get extra access to that computer. So there's loads of examples of that um, you know, in pretty much every operating system that exists where programming mistakes have been made and if you get an old version of Windows, like a few years old, um, you can pretty much get access to it remotely if it hasn't got all the security patches and stuff uh, applied. So, um, what can we do to defend against that problem? Some updates, patches, and software. Yes. So, updating software is very important for that reason. So, <coughs> if, you, um, if you've got a, a, an old version of software, there are security problems that may exist that, haven't been, that have been fixed. People know about it but your computer currently is vulnerable. 
So, um, can I see a show of hands? <coughs> if anyone here, uh, okay. So, if you, you if you've got Adobe Reader on your computer installed, show of hands. If you have every update, if it's currently up to date, lower your hand. If you think you might you've ignored some update warnings or something, keep your hand up. <laughs> okay. So now I tried to do it that way around so that you 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 know you already had your hand up. So quite a lot of you actually, depending on how old that version of Adobe Reader is, there's quite a high chance that I could basically take full control of your computer by sending you a PDF document if you opened it. So, the, so for those of you that had your hand up, it's time to update software. Uh, it's not just an annoying, well it is an annoying thing, but also why a lot of software is moved from warning you, like they often updates are automatic nowadays. But there's a, like older versions of Adobe Reader, um, and Adobe and Fi Flash, if you've got Adobe Flash installed and you haven't updated that, uh, again, uh, just by opening a document, uh, you might ac accidentally give someone else full, full control over your computer, basically. Uh, so yeah, it is important to keep software up to date, um, but it is quite, it, it's not straightforward sometimes managing all the updates and everything on a system, and if you work in a big enough company, um, as like a system administrator, you will um, often, depending on the, the company you work for, you might have a separate computer that you actually update first and check that the updates are working and everything before applying all of the updates automatically across the organization. In my last job, what we, did, we had a, an edit, editing computer and what we did is actually just took it completely off the network because it had lots of sensitive data on it, so yeah. nobody, could, nobody from the internet could actually use it. <coughs> Yeah, um, as long as you're not using yeah. USBs in the NSA. Yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting because the argument for doing that has changed over time. So originally for like um, industrial control equipment and everything, everyone was very much in favor of air gaps. So basically, if you've got something highly sensitive, don't connect it to the internet. And it does kind of make sense, but the risk of doing that is that the longer you've got it disconnected from the internet, the older and more vulnerable the software is that you're running. So if you haven't updated, you can't update Windows obviously, or very hard to if it's not connected to the internet, and therefore you're running software that's particularly vulnerable to attack if someone does manage to get at it somehow. Um, but if you do manage to keep it separate, then it is a, a very good way of keeping it secure, potentially. Can you not? Um, I might sound like a knob idea, but can you not shell a computer? Actually, put make it so that it runs inside of a shell, like an imaginary shell. Um, a, a virtual machine. Yeah. Do you like a virtualized computer? Yeah. Yes, you can. And that would that improve the protection of your computer, the security? Not yes, maybe. <laughs> can do. Yes, and we'll we'll cover that in some more detail later. So um. So the, there's all that. Um, you know, and also stable versus experimental software and all these sorts of things. So there's a lot for a company to decide about how they're going to keep the software up to date. Uh, if you're not a big enough company to worry about it, usually you just apply all the updates and hopefully what doesn't all break and when it does, you deal with it basically. But if you're a big enough company that you care, you can actually have computers that you test all the updates on before you roll it out to the rest of the organization. Um, so for example, in the last update from, um, or the second last update from Microsoft, introduced a um, flaw, basically, that made, um, actually this, that happened in the last week, um, for uh, PowerPoint, some kind of, they, they introduced, basically, they made it worse, and they were trying to fix something, but they ended up making it worse. So, so that's like, if, if that was gonna impact you a lot, it would be good if you tested that before you just rolled it out to all of your computers on your network. But again, that, that's quite a lot of work for an organization to do, so it needs to be quite, you need to have a lot of people to make that worth it. So another threat, external network access. So someone on the internet, um, so an external attacker who wants to look for a weakness on one of your servers to attack it, um, and they might be scanning for software that they can attack. Um, a lot of computers or servers will have a number of different programs or um, listening on different ports, so providing different services, um, and then potentially they could be attacked. Um, how would we avoid that from happening? Sorry? <coughs> <coughs> you, 
No, go on. What, what did you say? You said uh, turn your computer off. Turn your computer off. <laughs> you said turn it off. Yeah, well, that would work. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I think it, the last week, was it last week, I mentioned the, um, the security triad, one of which is being availability. So, one of your security goals is being available, usually. <coughs> so, you turn it off, it might make it more secure, but if you need those services, it might not be a great idea. Great idea. Yes, you turn your computer off. Any other ideas? Intranet. Yes. So an organization will often have an intranet, which is like an, usually it's just basically a website that you can't get to from outside the organization. You can only get it from within the organization, but how do you make sure that you can't access it from outside? That's kind of the question. It wouldn't be like, a, if you need to access any web pages, then you wouldn't restore them. Yeah, and then you maybe you're kind of sort. Yeah, any other ideas? <coughs> yeah. Yes. So using the firewall is basically the way that we um, limit the the interactions with um, outside people and our computers, basically. So yes, firewall. Just, sorry, did you have something else to? Yeah. yeah. So, Yes, so there's, that's like the detection side of things to like detect that you might be under attack. Although port scans happen so often that you wouldn't want to know every time someone port scans your system. But, um, but yeah, so firewalls, because it limits who can talk to what basically. So it's, it's, it's like a gatekeeper for the, the internet traffic that happens in and out of your computer. So you might look at the, the firewall looks at each individual packet coming off the network and go, is this something that's allowed based on the rules that I have? And if it is, then it lets it through. If it's not, it stops it. Um, so it reduces attack surface. So attack surface is like the things that you are exposed to. So if we have um, 100 programs running on our computer and they're all listening on the port, our attack surface is there are 100 different things we could try and break. If you use a firewall, you can say, actually, the internet only needs to be able to access this one service. We've now reduced our attack surface down to one thing that they can, that outside world can talk to. Um, another threat is local malicious code. So say, for example, our anti-malware and software updating and everything like that's failed, and we ended up with some malicious code running on the computer. Uh, hasn't been detected by anything. What can we do to pre to actually prevent it from doing lots of damage? And you kind of already answered this. So yeah. Take off the network. Yes. Okay. And Your previous answer was better when we were talking about it earlier, which was about access control. So file permissions and things. I won't get you guys to all try and guess that because we did mention it before. And the other thing is sandboxes and virtualization. So you, you asked about like confining a. Um, program or even a whole computer operating system. Um, so you can do that using sandboxing and virtualization. So virtualization uh, can is like in the labs where you've got a whole version of Windows running inside a Linux system. So that is virtualization. Um, and sandboxing allows you to control each individual program on the computer and what it's allowed to do. So that can do go a long way. So if we accidentally have some software that's not doing the right thing, if we've got a sandbox that controls what it's allowed to do, then it limits the damage it can do. So on like an Android phone, when you install an app, it, it tells you all the stuff that app's going to be allowed to do. So often they, often, it's not great because often a, an app will ask for like wide ranging permissions, so I want to be able to access the internet, the network, uh, and like your entire SD card and stuff, and it's like, yeah, yeah, I guess so, because I want the app. Um, and then it can do all sorts of damage. But if it, if it, if the application author specifies only a couple of permissions, then if there was a program mistake, or that program was trying to do something bad, it couldn't basically because there would be access controls and um, sandboxing in place to restrict what that program can do on the computer. So, what about people? Um, so, if you actually have um, people. If we gave everyone that worked for us the ability to do everything within the organization, all sorts of things could go wrong. So what can we do to actually limit the things that, that our employees can do? Security. 
User IDs. Sorry? User IDs. User IDs, yes. Active Sorry? Active <coughs> yes. Um, so when we're talking about user IDs, how do we know someone is who they say they are? Passwords, yeah. So that's authentication. So authentication is the way that we verify an identity. So we have a user ID for each employee. There's some way that they can tell us that they are who they say they are. So that generally there are factors, three or four different factors that you can use. So you can say uh, what they know. So for example, they might know a password, what they have. So they might have a smart card or some kind of badge or something who they are, so you might do like a fingerprint scan or a retina scan, use biometrics to, to confirm they are who they say they are, or and where they are. So if you see they're logging in from somewhere you don't expect them to be, then that might come into play as well as to whether you believe that they are who they say they are. Um, so yes, authentication, so that things like passwords. Access controls were also mentioned, so being able to control access to specific resources, and that's on a digital level, is things like file permissions, saying who can access a file. On a physical level, it's like things like this, like these gates, where you actually need some kind of badge or whatever, or in this case, just a ticket to, to be able to go through it. Uh, and in order for any access controls to work, there needs to be authentication first. So we need to first check they are who they say they are, and then we can enforce some rules as to what they're allowed to do. And some terminology, subjects are the people, so the users and programs, and objects are the things they're trying to access. So the um, things like files and network resources. And you know we use things like file permissions to do that. So encryption is what we can use to control access to information by hiding its meaning. Um, and Emlyn's going to be talking about that later in the semester. But basically, in very simple terms, you, you need some kind of a key or a password to actually decrypt to get the original information. And encryption does that for us. So it quite scrambles the information or whatever. Um, physical security. So um, sometimes digital security can be subverted if there isn't physical security. Can anyone give an example of that? Bouncer. Bouncer. So when you have physical security, when you can physically access something, sometimes you can circumvent controls that would normally be in place on a computer. So can anyone give an example? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So that that's that's a good example. So yeah, like as we discussed before, you can literally, if this computer has a login screen, I can just turn the computer, I pull the hard drive out, and see what's on it. So, the, having physical access to to things often means you can bypass various layers of security, unless we've got something like encryption in place. Um, and examples of physical security. Bank bolts, locks, yeah, all those sorts of things, gates and everything like that. So, uh, running out of time now, but it's just uh, just a couple of other points. Um, the threat is that something happens and we don't know about it. So the sorts of things that we can do to detect it is to basically make sure we're always monitoring the network. We can use things like intrusion detection systems to detect attacks. Um, typically, that means just listening to the internet traffic or the network traffic. Monitoring log files, so a log file is like a file on the computer that has the programs log um, events to, so we can look through that and check. We can look at the files that are on the system and try and detect unauthorized changes and respond to incidents and all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of like the, the, how you monitor a system. Managing security is important and it basically you need to make sure you're actually planning for your security goals, deciding how you're going to manage the risks that your organization faces making sure all the appropriate controls are in place, maintain them, monitor them, respond to incidents, recover from incidents, and deal with people. So in conclusion, um, we discussed the importance of defense in depth and given a very broad overview of a whole bunch of different types of things that we can put in place to secure a system. So we talked about anti-malware to protect against like malware, we talked about firewalls to basically control what type of network traffic's allowed in, and out of a system, we talk about authentication, so things like passwords, access controls, and file permissions, sandboxing, virtualization, and encryption. So hopefully that's kind of opened your eyes a little bit to um, just a broad overview of all the kinds of different things that we can put in place to make a computer more secure. Um, thank you. I'll see you uh, right here next week.
maybe. <laughs> you don't know. But uh, I'll see you soon. Thanks, guys.